Hey guys, welcome to today's podcast episode and our final guest for the day is Ray Schaub and he's out of New York City and he helps uh, business leaders uh, with mental fitness and recovery. I'm always fascinated by the psychology mindset um, here. I love talking to leaders about this area and I'm happy to have um, Ray to the show. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is wonderful to be here. Yeah, you're quite uh, strong because I know, uh, you know, you have, but uh, talk about your background and your journey and we'll dive right into it. Sure. What led me into what I'm doing, this course that I offer, which is a uh, mental fitness for business leaders in recovery, as you just said, it's a four month intensive and it grew out of my own experience getting sober. So I've been sober now a little over 23 years and it's been a very meaningful aspect of my life. But part of sobriety for many people is meditation. So I went deep into that uh, over the years and have been uh, a practicing meditator and mindfulness um, uh, practitioner for about 20 years at least, studying with a couple of different teachers. Uh, and then eventually my teachers came to me and said, it's time for you to start teaching. So I was really looking at what venue I wanted to teach through. I didn't necessarily want to go down the monk route. And so in, in sitting about two or three years ago, I've often been very quiet and very private about my sobriety, as many people are. But when I really took a long look at my life to look at the meaningful silos, if you will, meditation was a key one and mindfulness practice was a key one. Also, I've been an entrepreneur most of my adult life and grew up in an entrepreneurial environment. And that was a key thing. I owned a computer consulting firm, for instance, for about 15 years here in Manhattan, among other things. And then that last, that third pillar was sobriety. And I realized I have to bring that into the mix somehow. It's such a meaningful part of my life. So the Venn diagram of that is what created this course, Mental Fitness for Business Leaders in Recovery. And it's grounded in a new paradigm that was developed about two to three years ago by a gentleman by the name of Shirzad Shamin. And it's called Positive Intelligence. And it's all about, it's a, it's a program that's uh, based in modern science, but grounded in ancient wisdom. It really is trying to quickly and surely bring people who are interested into this present moment awareness that is what we're seeking when we're sitting in meditation or practicing mindfulness. For me, a business leader, from my perspective, is anybody from a, a stay-at-home entrepreneur, if you will, uh, a solopreneur, up to a, a Fortune 100 CEO. It doesn't matter. They're often dealing with the same stressors. They have bottom line things that keep them up all night. It's payroll, it's customer base, it's marketing, it's employment, you name it. They ha they both have that, that spectrum of concerns. And then recovery is for anything, anybody recovering in active recovery for me from alcoholism and or addiction. And what makes that focus unique is the fact that, like I said, business leaders don't shut it off at 5 p.m. And they often have a work-life balance issue where the stressors are follow them into each aspect of their lives. And alcohol and addiction, pe people in recovery, and as again, at least six months abstinent from their drug of choice, this is not a recovery program. It's for people in recovery. And, but people in that cohort often are trauma survivors. Trauma is a key aspect of alcoholism and addiction. So that means they have a heightened emotional life in many cases. They have things like hypervigilance and post-traumatic stress disorder and rage and anger can be quite an issue for many business leaders. And it can be pervasive, it can be out there types of anger, or it can be that seething, boiling, tamping it down Thing that is causing internal health problems. So it's very important to, to put these together and understand why they're a unique mix. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, introduction. And so we'll, let's, let's, I'm excited to dive right into the conversation. And first thing is most of the individuals that I talk to, the successful entrepreneurs and have always talked about mindfulness coaching, uh, meditation, uh, mental fitness, and what you were talking about is all the underlying is meditation. And what is meditation? Why is that the gateway to what you're doing? Ah, very good question. It's a very good question. For people, again, suffering from any type of trauma, whether it's led to addiction or not, oftentimes one of the key symptoms is what is obsessive thinking. The mind just won't stop. And we refer to it often as the hamster on the wheel. And they're chasing after something they're never going to get. And it affects their thinking, it affects their actions, affects decision making. It creates boogeymen in their minds of things that aren't necessarily that real. You lose a big client, it's an important client, but that translates into we're going bankrupt, we have to lay everybody off when that's really not the case. So meditation stills the mind. And what's beautiful about a paradigm like positive intelligence is that it borrows from the paradigm of physical fitness. So it's mental fitness borrowing from physical fitness in that when you go to the gym with a new trainer, you're likely to pick up light weights, do a few reps to get yourself started. So by the same token, when I take on a new student, I don't expect him or her to sit in the lotus position for 20 minutes and be able to focus on their breath to still their mind. But we do give them ways to do it for 30 seconds to start, even 10 seconds to start. It's amazing. And the idea is that they bring that activity in the mind down and they start to calm down that hamster to keep it going. And a still quiet mind will always find a better solution than a chaotic fragmented mind. It's that simple. And I, that's why you're hearing it over and over again in business circles, the power of mindfulness, the power of meditation. Harvard Business Review is a very big proponent of it. But many people just, they think it's impossible to quiet their minds. It absolutely isn't. And I'll tell you a little story about how I got started in this. When I first got sober, I owned a, my consulting firm. And as many alcoholics, I was, I was a straight up alcoholic and it was affecting my decision-making. It was affecting my emotional state. Alcohol in itself is a depressant. So it was causing depression and man and really firing up the flames of it. And I got sober in 2001, just a few months before 9-11. And I knew I had five clients in the World Trade Center, including the Port Authority, of New York, New Jersey, which owns owned the World Trade Center. And I just wasn't compass mentis to keep the company rolling. Even though the Small Business Administration was throwing money at companies exactly like mine to keep help keep their doors open, I was already had been traumatized early in life and uh, just wasn't able to handle it. So I closed the company down. I took a job out in New Jersey at a small company, uh, actually a very large company, in a, but in a half-height cubicle. It was a small office compared to what I had. And it was a crazy-making environment. I won't name the company. It was, an, it was a, just an insane environment and so stressful. And almost out of protest, what I did was I started taking one minute at the top of every hour. I would set my phone to ring at the top of every hour, and I would just stop whatever I was doing and just sit and breathe. And I wasn't trying to meditate. I was really doing it out of protest. Like, I can't do everything you're asking me at once. And then I extended that to about two, two or three minutes and because it felt so great. And then also out of protest, I decided to extend it a little further by saying, okay, when I come out of this two to three minutes, I'm going to move in slow motion. I'm just going to take one paper at a time. I'm going to open one email at a time. I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm not going to skim it. And I'm going to do exactly what it says, one little keystroke at a time. That's how I'm going to work this now. And I thought, I'll show them. 
What started happening is at the end of the day, the inbox was empty. My desk was clean. All of these ridiculous tasks were done and done quite competently. It had the exact opposite effect I thought it was going to have. And I called a friend of mine who happens to be a Zen Buddhist priest. And I described what was going on here. And he said, oh, you're meditating. I said, oh, no, not really. I'm not like doing my hands cupped and I'm not sitting there going. He goes, what are you, are you doing? doing? Well, I'm focusing on my breath. He goes, you're meditating. <laughs> okay. Okay. I kept it up. And for by the end of that year, I wound up earning 150% of my bonus. They had never had that happen before. It was an MBO program. And I they almost didn't know what to do with it. And it, it was as much a shock to me as it was to them. And I went from being identified early on in my career there as a, a loose cannon, somebody who could get very emotional very quickly, who was a know-it-all, to being introduced at the end of the year in a meeting as our one responsible adult in the room. So if anybody understands Kaizen, which is having an exponentially large impact by infinitesimally small steps. That was a real example of a Kaizen approach, which I didn't learn until later. So that's the power of meditation. Yeah. Interesting. And one thing that, one thing that, so like meditation, is it, is it one that what I was, for example, especially there was a great book that I read recently, it's called Crucial Conversations when the stakes are high, like when you have lives or money or a lot of things are at stake and when your emotions are really high and mm -hmm. everybody's on edge or you time constraints, these kind of, and your initial instinct is to, to, to argue your way or fight your way or which often leads in this is why you get like road rage or this is why you get into like arguments heated arguments. And I know a lot of guests on the show, they've had your similar experiences and they had to leave the corporate setting because they just, they had trouble controlling and they, these outbursts. Talk about using mindfulness, especially when your emotions are running high and your instincts are say fight, but then you're but then your mind is you need to calm down. And especially with type A, very aggressive, you, taking mm -hmm. a step back is really hard because you have an ego, you know, tempers, flare. How do you control that? That's one of the hardest things. It is one of the <laughs> hardest things. I had a huge rage problem when I first got sober and I'd had it all of my life. Mm -hmm. And as I started practicing mindfulness, I would be able to catch myself because when I was able to still my mind and bring my awareness into my body, I was able to notice the cues that rage was building. Mm -hmm. I was able to notice the cues that my heart was going, my heart rate was going up. My stomach was getting into a knot. My shoulders were coming up. My fists were clenched. Mm -hmm. And this might be in a conference room of everybody in a suit and tie. It's not a bar fight. <laughs> you start to key into your body by stilling your mind. And then there are things called mindfulness practices, which aren't necessarily meditation, but they're meditative. So that also brings awareness into the body. There's something called mindful activities. It's often exemplified by taking one infinitesimally small bite of something and examining it very closely and taking it into your mouth and very intensely noticing its flavors, its textures, its things like this. And this is an exercise to help you bring awareness into your momentary experience of your body. And it takes practice. So what I learned with my rage and my mindfulness is that as my mindfulness increased, it helped control the rages. And at one point I realized it is possible to back out of a rage as it's building, but like a parachutist trying to climb back into the airplane, it takes skill and practice. You're likely not going to do it very quickly the first time. So it really does start with these momentary uh, practices, 15 seconds, 30 seconds. And then eventually you're building up into minutes and then sometimes in some cases hours for some people can sit in meditation. But it, 
every increment that you do and that you can increase by will have an exponential impact on your ability to control your emotions. Mm. Yeah. And I really love this because one of the things I learned during my training was I had a mentor because it's actually, he was, no, anyways, he was a mentor and he was saying, I don't have fun. He's basically saying, be mindful of what you like people, situations, circumstances, and what that can lead to. And if you can avoid that, then once you're aware of these type, then you can avoid these situations and not get yourself in the trouble. And so no, for example, sometimes like my colleagues in healthcare, sometimes it could be nurses. Sometimes it's like other colleagues that just rub off the wrong way or just like these types of things. But sometimes, sometimes you have to deal with these. So talk about, for me, I would just basically, if I had to go into these situations, I would like just mentally prep myself, be like, just, and just be like sensitize myself before actually getting triggered. So I wouldn't be get as triggered as much. It's just everybody has triggers like this the mm -hmm. person. So talk about that. <laughs> yeah. No, you said a key word in there, awareness. Mm. So it's about building the awareness and the best way to build the awareness of your surroundings is again, to build awareness of yourself, starting mm. in your own body. Mm. So as you build that awareness and you become aware of what your triggers are, as you mentioned, many people don't know what their triggers are. They can't identify them yet. That often takes other modalities like therapy and psychiatry mm. to identify those triggers. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I espouse is that as you gain control of your mind, as you're able to quiet it down more and more, you can do visualization exercises similar to the way an athlete does or a doctor or surgeon does. You do your visualizations ahead of time of how you're going to do the surgery. By the same token, you can do a visualization on how you're going to handle this person. When so-and-so barges into the room and starts bragging about their latest success, that always gets me like this. What if you could train yourself to take three conscious breaths when he does that mm. before you respond? So with positive intelligence and some of the other paradigms, what I'm proposing, what I'm trying to take someone from is a negative reactive mindset that has that knee jerk reaction. Oh, there he goes again, kind of thing, but switch them over to a positive responsive mindset where you can go, oh, really? That's wonderful. I'm going to get some coffee <laughs> and you avoid being the other in the room. So it's, you really can bring yourself into a state where you can handle these things before they happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, it really makes sense. And because, yeah, and I love that. And there's always examples and on the basketball court or the sports arena, just athletes um, just losing their tempers. And part of it's like the op opponent actually intentionally tries to get on their skin to affect their performance. Mm -hmm. so, you know, oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I think we can say in the recent political environment <laughs> that in both the famous debates this year, in both cases, somebody worked to get under the other person's skin and did it quite effectively. Mm -hmm. And it's a very powerful outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can steal yourself from that. One can shield themselves from that through awareness. Just being able to be present in the moment. Um, that's what trauma can often trigger. Uh, it triggers the sense that your body suddenly goes into a fight or flight mode thinking it's under attack. Mm -hmm. And all the guy is doing is the, this other person is doing is bragging about some meaningless stuff. <laughs> And, but he gets under your skin or he asks you that question that gets me like, Hey, did you do this uh, yesterday? And you get defensive. Was I supposed to do that? And you realize it, when, when your mind is clear and you've had some advanced preparation for a moment like that, you're able to go, no, I didn't. And I don't really care. <laughs> uh, I have every intention of doing it later. Thanks for asking. And there's no emotional bubble around it. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. And which brings me to my next, because you mentioned trauma and how do you heal, how does someone heal over trauma and what do you see as the future of mental fitness? Because I'm really, I'm a big fan of the show uh, with, with Dr. Wendy Rhodes and the sports psychologists. And so what do you see as the future of mental fitness? 
Mental fitness to me is an adjunct to other modalities. It's not a replacement for them. So it's not a replacement for therapy or for psychiatry, or now there's, there are certain brain medical implants they're using for some trauma survivors as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is absolutely not, or spirituality, it's not a replacement for that either, but it is an amazing adjunct to them. It often has a magnifying effect on those other modalities. And I believe as more and more people discover it, which they are, it will come into wider use. And there are many therapists who are promoting this kind of work to their clients and to their patients. There's dialectical behavior therapy, which is basically mindfulness in three long words and all kinds of different therapies. But these other modalities have different functions and different purposes, but they all mix together quite well. My early sobriety was a three-legged stool of 12-step programs, therapy, and psychiatry, and then the mindfulness. So it was a four-legged stool, ultimately. And I, when I brought the mindfulness in, it elevated everything else. I was much more present in 12-step meetings. I was much more engaged in my therapy. There was much more of a point to it. It wasn't just a 15-minute conversation. I was much more compliant on my medications. I was, I had been playing with my psych meds that are early in the process. Today, I'm very grateful to say I'm not on any psych meds, but I, I tell people don't do anything without a doctor. I came off of mine without a doctor and have not been on them since, but, and that is partly due to the mindfulness exercises, but that's not a scientific quote. That's my personal experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can people find out more about you, follow you if they want to learn more about mindfulness and reinventing themselves and trauma recovery, all of that? Mine is a relationship. There's no impulse purchase here. There's no call now operators are standing by. Um, I invite people to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I believe you have my information and start a dialogue with me. Just reach out and say, I, I heard you on Dr. Lou's podcast. And I would love to connect and uh, we will simply start a conversation. And then from there, I'll tell you about the courses I teach or how I work with people and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I, I look forward to building relationships with people. It's very important. As I said, it's not an impulse purchase by any stretch. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed this conversation and I really enjoyed the power of mindfulness and um and meditation and just the very powerful practice and and it can really do a huge benefit in your life especially in these very tense stressful situations and for the audience be sure to follow ray's socials give them a follow and thanks so much for coming on yeah thank you doctor take care <laughs>